uh, in the last three lectures uh, we have been looking at uh, the photoluminescent properties in organic molecules and uh, we title those lectures as uh, the genie in a molecule. Uh, when we look at the uh, photonic applications not only the organic molecules have an edge over the inorganic uh, phosphorus in terms of uh, large area displays in terms of uh, economic viability, um, but at the same time we cannot refuse the potential of the inorganic phosphorus because in the last three decades um, the inorganic phosphorus have controlled any sort of uh, photonic uh, displays which has been in the market. <coughs> so, in today's lecture I am going to cover something about uh, uh, inorganic phosphorus. Um, especially I would like to uh, touch on three uh, important issues which has uh, come to prominence in the last uh, 5 to 10 years. Uh, one of the uh, issue is of quantum size con uh, effect uh, which uh, directly takes us to the issue of uh, nano science and uh, alloying effect in uh, this phosphorus how do they affect the P L properties and then doping effect in uh, um, this inorganic phosphorus. Notably if we look at the market and the emerging trends and uh, potential for uh, applications uh, one would see that uh, three compounds are choice uh, phosphorus which can be used in a variety of uh, environment one is cadmium sulphide zinc sulphide and zinc oxide. These are emerging photonic materials. So, I am going to take you through a course of slides just to impress upon you uh, these three aspects and also tell why um, <coughs> these uh, phosphors still will hold the market. Uh, this is not to underplay the effect of inorganic phosphors. They are very established technology based um, compounds, but uh, uh, nevertheless they will be competing with the organic uh, molecules in the uh, years to come. Uh, the first and foremost uh, that we cannot deny the potential of this inorganic phosphorus is the application in uh, display material. What you see here is the uh, CRT tube uh, cathode ray tube and in the cathode ray tube you have the cathode here and you have the anode here, anode is uh, nothing but your screen and this is typically how uh, the old generation computers have performed. So, this is a typical CRT tube where um, cathode the electron gun goes from here all the way hitting here. I will not go into all these uh, parts because this is a general description of a CRT tube, but quickly I want to take you to uh, the item number 8 in this uh, cartoon, 8 is nothing but the fluorescent screen, a glass which is coated with the, a graphitic layer, a very thin graphitic layer, but oh, between the graphitic layer and the glass is coated the phosphors and the phosphors are, are typically like this, they are called triads of red, green and blue. Red, green and blue phosphors are coated in this fashion. So, when you actually have the cathode ray going and heating at these triads in different proportion then you would get a um, continuous image coming out of the screen. <coughs> so, this is how a typical CRT uh, works, but the issue of color is actually determined by inorganic phosphors and what are these phosphors? Uh, they are mainly zinc sulphide doped with either silver or copper. If it is doped with copper then you get the green color and if it is doped with the silver then you get the uh, blue color and uh, yttrium oxide doped with europium is actually used for red. So, you have um, <coughs> the zinc sulphide based phosphorus holding key for the CRT applications as you see this is one of the very first uh, TVs which came in picture um, and this is a full color display. 
So, for full color display in our TV screens, you essentially resort to inorganic phosphors, uh, mainly those are zinc sulfide based ones. And uh, typically, the spectrum is like this, you can see uh, this is the silver doped uh, ZNS, this is the uh, copper doped ZNS and uh, the, these are the emissions coming from yttria doped with uh, europium. So, uh, in essence all three phosphors together control the full color display in a typical CRT tube and uh, what is uh, important here um, as I told you in the organic molecules we are talking about energy levels and uh, these energy levels are mostly to do with the uh, homo to lumo and the way the homo lumo is spread and uh, based on that you can tune the color this we have seen in the last three uh, talks. And uh, in this lecture I would like to take you uh, to the issue of band gap because in, uh, in inorganic phosphorus we are not talking about uh, discrete energy levels, but we are talking about band gap. And uh, this band gap essentially con uh, controls the sort of luminescence. As you know that valence band is always fully filled with the electrons and uh, any absorption of uh, radiation will uh, put this electrons in the uh, conduction band and the way the electrons come back will determine how the um, combination uh, recombination process occurs. Now, this is typically a semiconductor energy level that you see here. The, this, uh, uh, gap between these energy levels are exaggerated just to make sure that uh, um, we uh, we talk about this uh, process with some clarity otherwise they are a continuous uh, spread of this energy levels forming the valence band and the conduction band. So, in reality and at room temperature there are practically no electrons in the conduction band compared to the number of electrons in the valence band. Also, in reality the distance between the energy levels in the band is practically 0 compared to the size of the band gap. Um, now, what happens when you have a, um, some uh, light that is shining, the electrons can be ejected uh, in the presence of light and uh, they can uh, excite an electron into the conduction band as a result you um, get a hole and there is a hole and a electron that is uh, present in the um, valence band and conduction band. Now, this electron cannot stay there it has to come back and that is what will control the emission process and the band gap here will control the recombination uh, process and uh, this is typical for all the semiconductors including zinc sulphide. So, this is just to give you a picture uh, what is the photoluminescence that we are talking about in this uh, uh, game. So, in bulk semiconductors we have a fixed range of energies, um, we have hole, but the uh, electron which ha has gone into the conduction band has to relax. So, the relaxing electron emits fixed radiation. So, this has to come uh, throwing out some light. So, this causes a fixed emission peak of semiconductor. So, when the electron comes back then this is actually released as light and that is what we call it as uh, phosphorescence or uh, fluorescence. Now, notably uh, we, we can single out these three compounds which are of interest to us. Cadmium sulphide is uh, the low back band gap semiconductor um, and uh, zinc sulphide is uh, the uh, white band gap semiconductor. And in between these two zinc oxide also finds uh, interesting applications. So, all these are classified as white band gap um, 2, 6 semiconductor materials. So, uh, there are different possibilities that comes out because of the uh, band gap. One is we, since uh, zinc, cadmium, mercury they fall in the same group. Now, we can think of cadmium uh, zinc cadmium mercury. So, we can think of solid solutions between zinc and um, cadmium as a result we can go for a new set of uh, uh, white band gap semiconductors. Now, all this uh, hold a huge potential in uh, wide range of applications as I already told LEDs, solar cell, 
um, for backlight uh, purposes most of this uh, find uh, very useful um, applications. And um, because of the possibility of tuning this band gap modulations, uh, we can also tune the electrical and optical properties uh, by means of uh, quantum confinement or by alloying or by doping with the transition metal elements. Tuning properties include generating all colors invisible. We can also produce white light emission in this uh, inorganic uh, phosphorus, um, increase in excitonic binding energy and then room temperature lacing properties. All this can be realized in this group of compounds. So, uh, if you uh, control the size of your semiconductor particles which is actually equal or comparable to the exciton bore radius then uh, depending on the size either it can be uh, of this dimension or it can be less than even uh, a exciton bore radius or it can be much less than the exciton bore radius the bulk uh, e this is all in bulk semiconductor only but still if you can minimize on the uh, size uh, relative to the excitonic bore radius then you are actually manipulating or you are altering the band gap. So, you, if it is bulk and it is more than the bore radius the band gap changes are very minimal. In other words it could be as equal to um, the, uh, the bulk value, um, but if you make it comparable to bore radius then you are opening a band gap considerably higher than what is uh, found in bulk. But if you go further down which is much less than the um, excitonic bore radius then you can see that you are opening up a band gap which is much much bigger than what you see here. So, what we are finally ending up is a theme on tunable band gap according to the size of quantum dot semiconductor will measurably alter the band gap which means a tunable band gap. This is possible as long as the size of the dot is close to or below the um, exciton bore radius. Um, now, this is the uh, other picture just to drive home the point that you affect the band gap. So, this is a macroscopic crystal and uh, this macroscopic crystal can be of the order of uh, 0 to 5 millimeter. So, such big crystal and the band gap is uh, confined this way. Now, as you try to reduce this macroscopic crystal by some means either you can break it up or you can build it from uh, the bottom uh, to go to a optimum size then you can see as you go down in the size for, say from 6 nanometer down to 2 nanometer you are actually opening the band gap in this form. As a result when the band gap is getting altered you see the changes uh, coming out both in uh, optical properties, electronic properties as a result you can throw unique uh, variety of applications or uh, uh, variation in the properties just by controlling the band gap. So, this becomes a challenge for both chemists as well as physicists uh, as to understand what is the correlation between the size and the properties. So, in nano size or in quantum confinement you are throwing entirely a different gamut of properties which are not true for the bulk uh, materials. So, in quantum dots which is another important issue especially with cadmium sulphide or cadmium selenide based compounds you are talking about exciton bore radius that is the distance between the electron and the hole and this binding um, radius is what you call it as a exciton bore radius. So, this exciton bore radius if it is like this and uh, your uh, particle is much much less than the exciton bore radius then you are talking about a quantum confinement. If the size of a semiconductor crystal becomes small enough that it approaches the size of materials uh, exciton bore radius the electron energy levels can no longer be treated as continuous treated as discrete meaning that there is a small and finite separation. This situation of discrete energy levels is called quantum confinement. <coughs> so, uh, in quantum confinement what are uh, what is that we are looking at. Um, suppose you have three quantum dots 
then you are talking about 15 nanometer and that is uh, the size of range that we can simulate. If we are talking about <coughs> several such quantum dots uh, to the order of say 40 lakhs or 4 thousands of thousand dots then such small array will only constitute to the order of 2 centimeters. So, so many quantum dots you can try to assemble in just 2 centimeters. So, th that is the quantum confinement that we can talk about a field for the size of a quantum dot each dot is between 2 and 10 nanometers or 10 to 50 atoms in diameter lined end to end 2 million dots would be 1 centimeter long. Now, this uh, can uh, come by suspending the dots in liquid gel or solid matrix. So, we can prepare it in many different ways. Um, <coughs> so, the size dependent color also goes with the size as you see here if the quantum dot is uh, well below the excitonic bore radius now obviously, the color will be in blue. Now, if it is intermediate say around 10 nanometers or so you are talking something about uh, green and if it is beyond the excitonic bore radius then you are talking about red emission. So, one single system, but if you are going to confine it in different ways uh, different sizes then you play around with the whole spectrum of uh, uh, emission. So, quantum does the size of the band gap is controlled simply by adjusting the uh, dot this becomes a challenge for chemists because chemists have n number of ways to produce this quantum dots um, uh, typically the wet chemical roots and by which uh, you can uh, play around with a uh, wide range of particles which can affect the P L properties. Because the emission frequency of a dot is dependent on the band gap therefore, it is possible to control the output length of the dot. <coughs> Um, one of the classic example for such a quantum confinement is quantum dots semiconductor nanocrystals and uh, the notable ones which are um, potential for uh, this quantum confinement is cadmium sulphide selenide or telluride this is also called as chalcogenides. Chalcogenides are those which uh, form compounds with sulphur selenium and tellurium. So, cadmium based chalcogenides are a very candid material for quantum dot applications. So, is lead sulphide selenide and telluride and you also have this uh, 3 phi semiconductors like gallium phosphide, indium phosphide, gallium antimonide, uh, gallium arsenide all these are essentially possible to be for quantum confinement. So, this is typically a view graph uh, a TM picture of uh, cadmium selenide na nanocrystal which can be prepared as you see here this is of the order of 15 na uh, nanometers and each uh, dot will be somewhere around 5 to uh, 6 nan nanometers. Structure of this uh, cadmium sulphide quantum nanodots you can see in a matrix you, you can see how the um, uh, quantum dots can be arranged if you just take a high resolution TM image of one of this crystal then you can see that th this is clearly shows a well ordered quantum dot structure. Um, and this quantum dots can be capped with surface stabilizing capping molecules. So, if you want to preserve this uh, cadmium sulphide for specific applications the best way that you can preserve it from getting agglomerated with another quantum dot is to cap it. So, these are all the um, capping uh, molecules. So, this capping molecules can actually isolate every single quantum dot from the other in other words you can actually separate it out like this. So, each of this is a quantum dot in one sense because they are all capped with uh, a capping molecule of uh, this architecture. So, this is one way that you can uh, keep it and most of these cadmium selenides are not isolated as sal uh, solid uh, products they are actually as suspensions or colloids. So, if you want to coat it you can actually take a colloid or a suspension and spin coat it you get a quantum dot. Uh, so, that is the way to do it and uh, typically um, a, in a chemistry way you can uh, make this uh, quantum dots by uh, simple chemistry roots you can take um, a cadmium oxide solution 
and then you can uh, put selenium solution sel selenating agents and uh, if you can do it in argon atmosphere cadmium oxide plus selenium will give you cadmium selenide uh, uh, quantum dots or if you want to cap this uh, cadmium selenide with zinc sulphide all you need to do is in situ uh, as you are generating cadmium sulphide you try to put uh, zincating uh, molecules um, and this is a sulphur uh, uh, source. So, you can actually try to coat this uh, cadmium selenide with zinc sulphide. So, this is another way you, which you call this as cadmium selenide core shell uh, quantum dots and typically you can see that these quantum dots are of this size um, and it, it is well spread you can try to isolate it uh, as a colloid or as a suspension and the PL of such a com compound shows uh, a very strong red emission. So, this is uh, reported by Bavendis group. So, several such molecules are possible optical properties of this quantum dots uh, you can fine tune like anything. So, if you talk about cadmium selenide uh, the candidates are mainly from blue to uh, red, but if you want a uh, sharp red uh, color then you can go for cadmium telluride and you can see here um, that the band gap also changes um, with the, <coughs> the size or with the chalcogenides that you are talking about and uh, because of that you can actually um, generate a widespread of uh, PL emission uh, controlling the uh, particle size and in most cases you see the absolute quantum yield is uh, that of uh, 60 to 70 percent. So, such uh, highly luminescing uh, suspensions of quantum dots ca can be acquired and uh, uh, we can play around with several such uh, uh, systems not only cadmium selenide, cadmium sulphide uh, you can also um, play around with uh, uh, zinc sulphide based compounds. Uh, now, the one of the prime application of this quantum dots is in the biotechnological applications. Uh, what are the requirements for uh, bio applications? One is it should be efficient uh, fluorescence, uh, colloidal uh, stability should be there and it should have low non-specific uh, adsorption. So, if all three are taken care you can use this quantum dots specifically for biological applications main challenges uh, when you try to surface coat with organic uh, compounds then uh, the surface becomes hydrophobic therefore, if you want to tag it with some other molecule this hydrophobic nature will be reluctant to merge with another one therefore, you need to do a another surface modification so that you can tag it along. Organophilic ligands should be exchanged with more polar ones to make quantum dots biocomfortable that way. You can actually uh, make monolayer shells or multilayer sh shells and uh, over coating with proteins followed by other layers of bioconjugation uh, can also be achieved in order to enhance the application prospects. Drawbacks tends to aggregate and adsorb non uh, specifically especially when you try to play down on the surfactant then the issue of agglomeration comes into picture. So, quantum dot surface uh, coating for biocompatibility biocompat usually goes through this you can actually have this coating with uh, uh, cadmium sulphate quantum dots you can coat the outer shell with uh, uh, zinc sulphate and then you can have the capping agent. So, essentially this is one way encapsulating this with the hydrophobic core uh, of a micelle and uh, these quantum dots are encapsulated with the phospholipid uh, uh, micelles and uh, uh, depending on uh, the uh, range and the architecture of your core shell then you can see uh, different uh, tag ends can be generated. So, this is one way that you can increase the uh, biocompatibility and mainly the carrier that you would like to um, <coughs> tag these compounds with are the PEG, PE or PEG these are polyethylene glycols because these are biocompatible and uh, they would form a micelle um, of these uh, shells. So, it is very easy then to drive it into the uh, biological system. 
just to give an example whether this can be used uh, in a safe way um, in vivo uh, cell has uh, cell imaging has been done uh, using this quantum dots for example if you can uh, take a live uh, rat and uh, or a mouse um, red quantum dot can be injected which will go and target the tumor uh, zone so it's possible to uh, see how where the cancerous cells are so it uh, you can use this quantum dots uh, in vivo to <coughs> predict the malignancy uh, also quantum dots can be used for uh, breast tumor cells uh, here we have uh, uh, green quantum dots filled vesicles which they move towards the nucleus um, to spot the areas where uh, breast tumor cells can be located this was uh, proved by uh, Alevis Toss uh, as early as 2002 since then uh, this in vivo studies on quantum dots have been of active interest so uh, you can actually uh, now uh, play with the any sort of compounds and all it needs is a quantum confinement so you can actually uh, <coughs> modulate the band gap by moderating the size you can get a wide spectrum of colors and uh, um, the colors are also very specific so if you want uh, any combination you can go for such uh, specific uh, colors using quantum confinement uh, now another example of <coughs> alloying that we have seen uh, in the literature is that of zinc sulfide cadmium sulfate this is not the quantum confinement uh, uh, issue but this is uh, another issue in uh, phosphorescence that is alloying so you take zinc sulfide you put a low band gap uh, sulfide there what really happens you can see here as you are doping the mm, cadmium sulfide a is uh, cadmium more and as you um, decrease the cadmium content you see that the absorption is going towards the blue color and uh, uh, typically your emission also goes uh, from red to um, blue so uh, from green to blue so you clearly see with the addition of uh, cadmium 0 0.9 or uh, 0 0.75 0 0.64 0 0.5 again you can see that uh, the uh, absorption edges uh, changes and it directly affects the photoluminescence so this is uh, one way uh, of uh, trying to tune the band gap and we call this alloying because zinc and cadmium uh, they are in the same group and therefore they are structurally similar they crystallize in the same symmetry and it's possible for you to keep on loading cadmium uh, into zinc sites so this is one way of uh, alloying the uh, phosphor uh, this is uh, another view graph that shows suppose you have cadmium instead of uh, zinc and you keep uh, adding zinc what really happens so as you decrease the um, zinc content from 90 percent to 5 percent you can clearly see that uh, the um, PL intensity varies and also the maxima keeps shifting from here to here the maxima shifts to lower side as you keep uh, doping it with uh, more and more of uh, zinc compounds so either way you can do reverse engineering either you can try to blue shift it or red shift it depending on the size of the atom uh, and uh, <coughs> such tuning is possible uh, we can also tune uh, the properties by going for uh, uh, metal ion substitutions for example if you take zinc selenide uh, it uh, shows emission in near blue region okay so if you start doping with transition metals these are all activators in this uh, uh, band gap so depending on the nature of uh, the transition metal that you are doping you can get uh, specific colors um, you can you can play around between 400 to 550 nanometer if you are doping with copper and uh, specifically if I am interested in red then I would go for manganese doping so just by doping a particular transition metal you can actually play around with the um, uh, with the color coordinates and uh, this was uh, proposed as early as uh, 2005 by Pradhan and co-workers and um, uh, another uh, important thing is 
Um, the photoluminescence is very sensitive to the crystal field uh, uh, environment and as a result even if you are going to dope just 2 percent of manganese or 6 percent of manganese you can tune the band gap considerably. Uh, Sharma, uh, D. D. Sharma's group have uh, reported uh, quite a bit on this where you dope manganese in uh, zinc sulphide or doped manganese in cadmium sulphide you can clearly see with this is the undoped uh, zinc sulphide uh, uh, PL emission which is centered around 450 uh, nanometers or so. The moment you try to dope uh, manganese then you see the shift is more towards 600 and this is peculiar for M and 2 plus um, uh, crystal field site and uh, therefore, you even with 1 or 2 3 percent you can immediately sh uh, shift the PL emission. Same is true for uh, manganese doped uh, cadmium sulphide. This is the undoped uh, uh, PL of uh, cadmium sulphide. The moment you put uh, uh, manganese you can shift it to red region. So, manganese is very specific to um, these uh, semiconductors. So, you can tune the uh, band uh, with minimum quantity of manganese doping and this is what happens in both these cases you can see uh, when you have smaller ratios say 0 0.10 percent 0.19 percent you can clearly change the PL compared to um, uh, larger doping concentration. So, even with small amount of uh, manganese we can fine tune and in this case you can see uh, each of these colors are specific to the CAE coordinates. So, if you want something near to white you can see here um, for 0 0.10 percent or 0.19 percent you can clearly get uh, nearly white uh, light emitting cadmium sulphide uh, nanoparticles. So, uh, this is one way that we can tune the color. Just before I go to specific examples uh, from our own work I would like to list some of the important semiconductors which are already in market. There is there is established technology already uh, for the semiconductors and uh, these are the list of materials that we can see which is already used in our optoelectronic applications. For example, we are talking now about zinc sulphide, zinc selenide they are already in LEDs which are they are used in LEDs and uh, you also have uh, cadmium telluride used in detectors. Mostly you can see um, the gallium based uh, indium based ones which are uh, traditionally used um, and this is one of the reason why organic molecules are uh, challenging because uh, these are very expensive routes to make LEDs. So, if you can use a rugged organic molecule for both uh, large area uh, displays as well as for minimizing on the threshold uh, voltage uh, then you can actually bring down the cost of this uh, LEDs uh, by orders of magnitude. So, this is one of the reason why organic displays are more prominent in today's application, but nevertheless these are proven technology where the chemistry or the physics of the semiconductors are already understood. Uh, so, with this in view let me go to um, some of uh, the examples from our own group just to show that how the chemical roots can actually modify the sizes and depending on the size how the PL can vary. So, just one example on the quant, uh, quantum size effect um, how we can make this sort of uh, quantum dots. Uh, without capping because once you cap it then you try to modify or you try to restrict the um, applications you cannot use it uh, as it is. So, one of the main thrust is to uh, prepare uncapped uh, cadmium sulphate. One of the way that you can do that is uh, using sonochemical synthesis. The principle of sonochemical synthesis I have already discussed in the uh, first module on preparation. Therefore, uh, the simplest way to work on it is take uh, cadmium acetate and uh, uh, elemental sulphur in a DMSO you can just uh, um, sonicate it for 3 to uh, 5 hours. You can get uh, uh, well dispersed cadmium sulphide and nanoparticles. How do we know that uh, we have nanoparticles? We can look at the um, properties and uh, how we can achieve this uh, nanoparticles by simple cavitation technique 
and this cavitation will break into a hot spot and this hot spot will essentially uh, will try to take out the organic moiety it will sort of cleave the organic moiety and then it will release um, reactive cadmium and this will react with your uh, cad uh, sulfur and form cadmium sulfur nanoparticles. So, this is a simple way uh, one of the reason why we uh, can resort to sonar chemicals stuff is you do not have any side products that will affect the uh, cadmium sulfide nanoparticles everything will go into the solution therefore, you can easily preserve it. Uh, just to give a comparison between uh, the properties of a cadmium sulphide prepared by two different methods. For example, you can prepare it by microwave where you can take cadmium acetate and sulphur uh, elemental sulphur expose it to microwave you will get cadmium sulphide. You can also use it uh, use sono chemistry to prepare and uh, just to give you an idea how they look the particle size distribution of the sonar chemically prepared one clearly shows the average agglomerate size is well below 1 micron whereas, in the microwave um, reaction you see a spread like this. So, if you are actually looking for specific application it is not possible to use a um, cadmium sulphide particle which has such a wide range you need to have a narrow range and in such cases you can see that uh, the sonar chemical approach is very selective. One of the way you can also answer this question whether it is nano or not or uh, whether it is below 10 nanometers is from the broadening of the peak. You can see the x-ray broadening of this peak clearly suggests that they are uh, in the nano range uh, although uh, this is also in nano range, but still it is much narrower compared to sonar chemically prepared compound and uh, typically. Uh, if you look at the uh, TM pictures you can see uh, clearly the variation this is clearly in the amorphous range because your electron diffraction pattern of cadmium sulphide shows a blurred uh, pattern which means it is amorphous, but this one is crystalline the one prepared by microwave is crystalline it gives a dot pattern and uh, the, uh, the size of the uh, clusters are well below 10 nanometers. So, each of these are particles and if you look at this they are below 10 nanometers whereas, this is roughly around 20 to 30 nanometers. So, depending on the preparative route you can actually prepare a wide size of range and these ones although they are agglomerated you can see specifically they are uh, individual particles just fused together without any capping that is important and once we prepare uh, particles less than 10 nanometer you can also see that they are blue shifted. So, you can see that the blue shift for um, cadmium sulphide compared to the uh, microwave prepared uh, cadmium sulphide particle. Yeah. So, um, another example of how we can modify these uh, uh, compounds by chemical route uh, let us take the microwave route and uh, take specific example of uh, uh, cadmium sulphide which is doped with zinc. So, cadmium if you keep on increasing from say 1 percent to 5 percent 1 to 5 percent of uh, zinc you can clearly say even with such low doping concentration this is your cadmium sulphide typical hexagonal structure and once you start doping with zinc you can see that these x-ray peaks are slowly coming down and they fade and immediately transforms into a cubic phase which is typical of zinc sulphide. So, from a hexagonal to a cubic pattern you can just simply transform in just uh, um, with less than 5 percent of zinc doping. So, the fact that it affects the crystal structure clearly shows that you can engineer this compound you can make solid solutions. Similarly, we do not have to confine just with the uh, uh, lower uh, doping concentration of zinc we can go 10 percent, 20 percent, 30, 40 and 50 percent you can clearly see uh, compared to your parent cadmium sulphide you can almost make a, a amorphous or weakly crystalline uh, zinc sulphide uh, based uh, cubic pattern. So, uh, definitely uh, using uh, chemical roots we can successfully dope and uh, this is the view graph of uh, how the zinc sulphide doped cadmium sulphide nanoparticles are 
and you can clearly see that uh, the, these are all the uh, embedded particles uh, and they clearly shows the um, crystallinity and the uh, lattice planar spacings are specific to the zinc concentration and uh, this is your SAD pattern showing that these are crystalline and uh, we can index that to uh, specific planes. Now, when we look at the absorption spectra and the PL spectra, uh, one can clearly understand how we can alloy this compound and if alloying is really true, then it has to show in the optical bandage. Cadmium sulphide as I told you is a low band gap material compared to zinc sulphide. So, if you actually dope cadmium sulphide with zinc immediately you will see the shift in the uh, absorption edge. So, typically you can see say from 550 it comes down to nearly 420 nanometers. So, this is one way that you can understand whether your chemical doping or chemical process is really uh, useful for uh, <coughs> fine tuning your band gap and uh, uh, if that is so then your PL spectra should also show changes and you can see here zinc sulphide shows very large bandwidth mainly because it is turning more amorphous and uh, uh, it is uh, cubic in pattern and uh, because of that you have a um, very broad PL emission compared to cadmium sulphide. So, any sort of zinc incorporation will widen your PL emission and this is uh, noted in the um, emission spectra. Now, we can also try to see uh, how um, uh, the zinc doping really affects. So, you take the cadmium sulphide case and start doping it with the zinc. You can see as you go from 1 to 5 percent of zinc doping, you can, uh, you can notice that there is a peak that is propping up from zinc doped ones say around 550 nanometers and this is typical for the influence of zinc on cadmium sulphide. Okay. So, this is your cadmium sulphide uh, uh, emission and uh, once you start doping with zinc you see this hump is coming and this is mainly coming from defect emission because in zinc sulphide if your um, sulphur concentration is less then immediately it will induce a defect concentration. So, zinc seems to be more sensitive to sulphur deficiency or sulphur defects compared to cadmium um, sulphide. So, this is one thing that you can uh, note and also as you go further from 0 to 50 percent you can see that the PL is uh, shifting towards uh, blue and these uh, defect induced concentrations uh, or emission is more pronounced as you keep on doping higher amount of zinc and once you go more towards uh, cadmium sulphide you can see that uh, you almost get a defect free uh, emission that is possible. Uh, now, if you have broad emission then one of the thing that we would like to do is see whether we can get a broad emission that would amount to uh, white light emission. So, how can we do that? Uh, if we try to take this uh, composition which is 50 50 in other words those should be slightly cadmium rich compositions 0.54 or 0.51, 0.54, always keeping cadmium slightly rich compared to zinc. In other words they are nearly 50 50, but intentionally we keep cadmium on the higher side. Then if we try to dope uh, 1 percent, 2 percent and 3 percent of manganese, we can try to see what is the influence. If you look at the absorption spectra, you can uh, see that this is the uh, zinc sulphide band gap and this is your uh, cadmium sulphide uh, band gap and the moment you try to dope with uh, manganese uh, 1 percent in a cadmium rich situation, you can see that the bandage is immediately shifting to red. So, even with the little incorporation of manganese it is very sensitive. So, you can push this to higher band gap and how do we know that manganese is clearly doped in all these concentrations 
if you take the EPR spectra that is electron paramagnetic resonance spectra you will see this sextet that is six line spectra. So, this six line spectra is typical for m n 2 plus concentration why because this is a d phi system and this is supposed to show six lines and you can clearly see that the six line spectra is pronounced which means manganese is actually isolated. So, you can selectively dope manganese in the zinc sulphide suppose there is manganese manganese 2 plus interaction this six line spectra will not come it will come out as a broad spectra which means manganese are clustering together it is not doped uh, clearly. So, uh, one can go for very elemental uh, range of uh, doping and precise way you can dope this um, uh, this coactivators and you can fine tune the uh, band. And the emission that is mainly responsible uh, for this uh, 600 nanometer emission comes from the manganese 2 plus concentration and uh, this is mainly because of the uh, 4 uh, T 1 G to 4 A 2 uh, excitation as a result you get this pronounced uh, 600 nanometer peak that is coming. So, if you see 600 nanometer peak it is purely because of the coactivator that is responsible which is nothing but your manganese ion. So, manganese 2 plus will induce such a selective emission <coughs> and that is what you see here. Uh, so, I start with uh, cadmium uh, sulphide cadmium zinc sulphide. Now, you see here that this is your uh, uh, equiatomic com nearly equiatomic composition and in this case the broadening is of the order of 100 nanometer. Now, if you go um, to manganese doped ones 1, 2 or 3 percent you can clearly see for optimum of 3 percent concentration which is your red one you can see almost your full width at half maxima is 155 which means it is a very good candidate now for fine tuning white light. So, uh, what you essentially do is you try to stretch the con uh, the emission both uh, towards the blue towards the red by just altering your uh, composition with manganese. So, in other words uh, you can actually use manganese for white light emission this already I also showed from one of the examples of uh, DD Sharma's group that it is very specific even if you put uh, 0.10 percent or 0.4 percent then you should be able to bring about um, a candid change in the PL spectra. So, this one example by which you can fine tune to get a white light, um, but at the same time this is very specific because instead of taking cadmium excess suppose I take zinc excess ok. In other words zinc is more in this equiatomic composition. Now, if I take zinc and still doped manganese immediately you see that broad emission what you see here this broad emission immediately goes to a narrow emission. So, such is the sensitivity of your band gap you know even if you put manganese there now it is only a green emission because it is the cadmium rich compositions which are important. So, um, one thing is the host lattice another one is the guest lattice. So, your host lattice is as much important as your guest. So, uh, in other words uh, to sum it up we can say cadmium rich ones are good for broad emission and zinc based ones are good for narrow emission and you can fine tune that with manganese uh, doping. So, this is one example that I wanted to show and this is how the band gap can be looked at you have a white band gap uh, zinc sulphide and then you try to make a solid solution with the, your cadmium sulphide. Now, you are actually altering the band gap and in between if you put coactivator like uh, manganese 2 plus you are essentially uh, inducing uh, broadly uh, broad emission. So, this is the schematic diagram showing all possible transitions involved in the emission feature as I told you we have this uh, peculiar emission which is responsible for uh, the broad emission. Now, I will try to show one more example um, 
of uh, alloying effect in zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is uh, very uh, interesting because uh, it is used as a UV sensor. Now, if you want to alloy it, you can try to do that either with manganese or you can try to do that with uh, uh, cadmium, uh, cadmium doping. So, typically the zinc oxide band gap is 3.3 EV, but you can actually dope it with the magnesium and cadmium. Uh, magnesium is a um, dopant which has a very high band gap that is 7.5, it is called a wide gap band gap insulator. Now, cadmium sulphide is a low band gap uh, stuff. So, this is having 2.3 and uh, because they have comparable uh, these these two have comparable size it is possible although they have very uh, high uh, band gap um, variation still you can try to put as much of magnesium into zinc. So, this is one way we can try to alloy this compound and uh, <coughs> then uh, what becomes important is you cannot keep on doping magnesium there because it will be restricted since magnesium oxide and uh, cadmium oxide they throw a cubic phase compared to wood side phase. So, what is the solubility limit? So, magnesium actually has a solubility limit of 4 percent this has been widely suggested and uh, uh, one can actually try to put zinc into magnesium phase up to 40 percent, but it is not possible to put magnesium into zinc phase which is very very uh, critical. So, um, is it possible to increase the uh, concentration of magnesium by means of uh, some other wet chemistry route which uh, which can give a metastable phase that is one question that we can try to answer. Cadmium solubility is only 2 percent can we increase it using um, any uh, chemical procedures. So, uh, many uh, uh, studies have gone through and I will just show some of our own results on this zinc oxide this can be tuned by alloying up to uh, si 6 percent to 16 percent people have achieved it by first depositing gold on silicon and then uh, over the gold layer you try to deposit it because of the uh, mismatch in the lattice parameter you can try to do that as you can see these are all the rods that you can grow and the tip of the rod is actually a gold which will keep coming as a flux. So, it is more like a surfactant your uh, as you keep growing your zinc oxide the gold will come on the tip that is what you see here the uh, from this SEM picture. Now, is it possible to grow cadmium uh, doped zinc oxide? Yes you can clearly see that the bandage is shifting and the uh, lambda max is also shifting. Therefore, by means of vapor phase deposition it is possible to dope uh, cadmium this is proposed by Wang in 2005. And uh, if that is the case then what happens to the bandage and to the PL you can see here um, in this case uh, 30 percent cadmium when you dope then it is shif shifting. Uh, to a lower um, uh, band gap and uh, the absorption also shifts to the lower band gap. So, with increase in cadmium you can push this to a lower band gap emission. So, this has been done by MBE grown um, zinc cadmium oxide uh, films and uh, this is reported in APL in year 2006. So, uh, one can use uh, MBE technique for making such uh, heterostructures and this is uh, the view graph of your uh, zinc magnesium oxide nano needles which are grown on silicon. You can see these these are the uh, grown needles shaped uh, structures of this uh, zinc magnesium oxide that you can grow and uh, they clearly show the lattice fringes which is typical of the zinc magnesium oxide. And uh, as you would see here with the, uh, with the different concentration of uh, magnesium you can actually shift the uh, PL emission and therefore, it is possible for you to achieve in this case even up to 20 percent of uh, magnesium can be doped uh, skillfully. Um, we can also try to alloy it by doping it with uh, um, copper and in this case you can see how the PL varies uh, the maxima shifts 
towards the red and uh, PL uh, also changes considerably with uh, copper doping. Uh, one other way that we can prepare this compound is uh, by uh, using microwave polyol uh, synthesis which we will try to discuss in the next lecture.